Hello everyone and welcome to our today's webinar by Les Instruments. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Matthias Karg, from the Heinrich Heine University in Dusseldorf, Germany. As an expert in the field of colloidal self-assembly, functionalized nanoparticles and spectroscopy techniques, he will be reviewing particle shape characterization as done with light scattering. This webinar is an interactive event as always, and I encourage you to submit any questions you may have using the chat that you can see on the lower right side of the window. We will discuss them after the presentation and a transcript of the Q&A session will be made available. Please also note that this event is being recorded and will be available on our website within the next few days. So, without further ado, let me now hand it over to Matthias. Well, thank you very much, Colleen, for the nice introduction. Welcome, everyone. It is my particular pleasure, pleasure to be talking to you in this webinar today. So as Colleen mentioned, the topic will be addressing the characterization of particle shape using light scattering. And before I get started and show you what this webinar is going to be about, I just want to mention a few words about us, so me and my group. So we have more than 15 years of experience in light scattering, and that comprises dynamic light scattering, static light scattering, depolarized dynamic light scattering, but also um, some more advanced techniques using pump probe dynamic light scattering. Except for this pump probe aspect, I will be touching all the other techniques in this uh, webinar. So what we do is we work on colloids and polymers and uh, often interfaces play a crucial role. We use self-assembly to um, look at um, colloids, for example, on interfaces or in bulk, and also plasmonics is a topic of interest to us. And very often we use scattering techniques. And obviously that's one reason why I'm talking to you today. So um, not only light scattering, but also neutron and X-ray scattering. We do apply these techniques to study the size and the shape of particles and the dispersity also in size and shape. Then often for structure factor characterization, uh, stability, so colloidal stability, molecular weight, and also um, frequently for in situ studies. So we look at growth of particles during synthesis, for example. We look at aggregation of particles when, for example, salt is added to a solution of charge stabilized colloids, and we look at phase transitions. So this webinar, I will start with a short general introduction to light scattering. Then I will touch some aspects of static light scattering, followed by dynamic light scattering, and then ending with depolarized dynamic light scattering. So very generally, one could ask why light scattering at all? And there's very good reasons why to do light scattering. Um, often, and I would say this is mostly the case, it's non-invasive. So as long as you do not have um, materials that strongly absorb in the wavelengths range that you use for your experiment, um, typically the bombardment with photons doesn't um, change the sample um, due to the low energies. It is uh, generally quite fast technique, given large enough contrast, of course, and uh, one should always keep in mind that the statistics are just great, and this is because of the uh, extraordinary high photon flux. So even quite simple low power lasers yield an enormous photon flux. So the number of scattered photons given good enough contrast is huge. And therefore, this method has fantastic statistics. It is also extremely sensitive to the presence of small amounts of aggregates. Uh, and then, and this can be a disadvantage um, also to impurities. So dust, for example, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Then another good reason is often that we can use relatively small sample volumes. And I put here the number approximately one milliliter, um, which is typically sufficient for standard light scattering experiments. But depending on the geometry and the size of the cuvette that you use, you can even reduce that to smaller volumes. So we've been able to do experiments 
um, let's say, up from 300 microliter or so. The size range that you can cover is quite broad. It's one order of magnitude, so from the nanometer to the micrometer scale. And therefore, it's ideal for many systems of the colloidal and polymeric and also biological world. So to get started with the process, what's, what's happening, I first of all want to remind you how a uh, scattering experiment looks like. And this is apparently quite, quite simple. So we need a light source, of course. This is a laser. This is typically focused by a lens onto a cuvette that holds our sample, typically in disp dispersion. Um, and then we have another lens, and the two lenses basically define our scattering volume and the scattering geometry. And then we have a simple detector. So the job of the detector is typically quite simple. It counts scattered photons. What then happens if we have an incident electromagnetic wave hitting on our sample is that um, our scattering object can be an atom, can be a particle. Um, uh, independent of that, the incident electromagnetic field um, the oscillating electromagnetic field will cause the induction of a, of a dipole, and this dipole then oscillates with the same frequency as the incident light, and this dipole is radiating scattered light. So the scattering comes from this dipole excitation. And we can distinguish between elastic scattering, where there is no energy transfer between our incident wave and the sample, and thus there's no change in wavelengths, or inelastic scattering that you, for example, all know from Raman scattering. So there we have a change in wavelengths, so um, related to, to energy transfer between our incident wave and the sample. In the light scattering scenarios that I would like to discuss in this webinar, we deal with so-called quasi-elastic scattering. What that simply means is we do not really distinguish whether we have an elastic or an inelastic scattering process. We treat all scattered light simply as elastic or quasi-elastic scattering. So our detector is not sensitive to the wavelengths of light. It simply counts photons. And thus, we do not know whether there was any energy exchange or not. So we can distinguish different scattering domains depending on the object size. So consider you have uh, a dispersion and in there you have scatterers, so for example particles. If the particle diameter, D, is much smaller than the wavelengths, we deal with Rayleigh scattering. And this Rayleigh scattering is isotropic scattering and we all know Rayleigh scattering when we look at the blue sky on a nice summer day. So there is light scattering occurring at the atmospheric gas molecules. And these are small and much smaller compared to the wavelengths. And then we have wavelengths dependent scattering. And I'll show you an equation for that in a few seconds. If we now make the particle or scattering object size larger and we approach the wavelengths or even larger, then we deal with me scattering. And me scattering is characterized by a very strong angle dependency of the scattered uh, light. And then for objects much, much larger than the wavelengths that we use, we deal with Fraunhofer scattering. And there we have an even more pronounced angle dependency of the scattered light. So I show you the analytical solution actually for Rayleigh scattering um, without going in, in all the details of this equation. Uh, we have I, which is a scattered intensity. We have I0, which is the intensity of the incident beam. Then we have a dependency on theta, our scattering angle, in the plane of scattering. And I'll show you later what I mean by in the plane. And then uh, the large R is actually the distance from the scattering um, volume to the detector. We have lambda to the power of minus 4. That is one very important thing to keep in mind when thinking of Rayleigh scattering. And again, that's the reason why we have the occurrence of the sky being blue at a nice sunny day when the sun is up in the sky. And then 
I want to highlight two important sample related um, parameters here in this or, or terms in this Rayleigh scattering equation. And the one comprises n, which is the refractive index, uh, being the typical quantity one uses for a particle dispersion or, or whatever dispersion to look at in light scattering. This is to remind you connected to the polarizability. So we have here contrast, so to say, to the square or polarizability to the square. And if you remember, polarizability depends on the object size or electron density, so to say. And the size of the scattering object is in that Rayleigh scattering equation with a six power. So we have diameter or radius, diameter to the half being radius to the power of six. And that means that we have a very, very strong dependence of the scattered intensity on the object size. And this is also the reason why we are so sensitive to aggregates and impurities, as I mentioned two slides earlier. So if we now look at static light scattering, and I didn't have to do much to illustrate here because we have this nice illustration here um, showing what we do in a static light scattering experiment. So we have our sample, we have our detector, and all we do is we record the time average of the scattering intensity as a function of the scattering angle theta. And then depending on the object size and geometry, we get a different intensity versus angle um, profiles. So to keep in mind for the time being is we measure the time average of the scattered intensity. And we can do that as a function of angle. This can then be used to determine form factors, P of Q. And I'll show you some examples on the next slide. We can determine the radius of gyration, Rg. We can, for concentrated samples, determine the structure factor. We can determine molecular weight and even interactions. So the second virial coefficient, A2, is accessible, being a convenient measure to be able to judge whether the sample is stable or favors, for example, interparticle interactions. I will not touch structure factor molecular weight and interactions in this webinar. This is a different topic on its own. So I will with focus on static light scattering, show you some examples of form factor and also what the radius of gyration, um, how you determine that and how you can use it for shape analysis. Very important is um, the scattering angle, as, if I, um, yeah, as you saw in this uh, uh, animated sketch here. And the scattering angle is related to the scattering vector. And the magnitude of the scattering vector is given here. So we have 4 pi n, with n being refractive index, over lambda times sine theta half. So typically in a light experiment, light scattering experiment, we deal with a constant lambda. We do not change our laser in the setup. We stay with one laser in a typical experiment. And therefore, we only vary theta and then cover different ranges of this magnitude of scattering vector. For typical experiments, um, I'll just run some numbers here. So we deal with a angular range from 20 to let's say 150 degree. It depends a bit on the setup and what you have in the beam pass. Um, and then I use the example of the instrument that we are using operated with a helium neon laser. Um, so with 632.8 nanometer wavelengths. And then if you calculate the magnitude of the scattering vector, we get these values here. So a range from 0.0046 to 0.026 reciprocal nanometer. Reciprocal nanometer um, is so reciprocal length scale. So keep in mind that Q is a measure of the resolution of your instrument. In our case, for light scattering, the range of Q is small. And that is related to the large wavelengths of the laser set we use. And this renders SLS perfectly suited if you want to resolve global structures, for example, of colloids, polymers, etc. If you are interested in 
more local structures on the atomic or nanometer scale, you have to use smaller wavelengths. And there comes into play typically X-ray or neutron scattering. The scattering intensity in, in general, and that's also true for neutron and X-ray scattering, is proportional to the product of the form factor P of Q and the structure factor S of Q. The form factor of a simple sphere is given here. So a simple sphere of radius R, do not want to go into detail of this formula, but you, you see this sine and cosine terms. And if you then measure a form factor, this is an example for one micrometer diameter particles, you see oscillations in the form factor um, mathematically understandable by the sine and cosine terms. Uh, then if you want to interpret that in terms of what's happening optically, this is constructive and destructive interference. So in the minima, we have destructive interference. At the maxima, we have constructive interference. And the form factor is nothing else than the Fourier transform of the distribution of scattering centers in your scattering object. So consider your scattering object, for example, a sphere consisting of smaller spheres in itself. Then each of the smaller spheres represents a scattering center. And the spatial distribution of the scattering centers in that overall object, for example, a sphere, is then dictating the form factor. So if you take these positions, make the Fourier transform, you come to the form factor. The structure, oh, sorry, quite importantly, um, you also see that here in this experimental result. If you go to small q or to small angles, then your form factor ultimately approaches one. You, this is not normalized. That's why we are, have random numbers here. But you see for lower q, even our experimental form factor here approaches a plateau. And ultimately, when correctly normalized, the form factor should approach one. The structure factor is mathematically actually quite similar than the form factor. But now we are not looking at the distribution of scattering centers in one scattering object. We are rather looking at the distribution of scattering objects in our scattering volume. So consider you have many spheres at high enough concentration, and their, their positions will not be independent of each other. And with large n being the total number of scattering objects, and these vectoral components rj and rk being the positions or the vectors pointing to the center of each, each scattering object, we basically do a, um, yeah, a, um, a Fourier transform of the real space distribution of the position of each scattering center. I will not touch that any further in this webinar. And I can do that because I will show you examples for dilute dispersions. In dilute dispersion, the positions of each scattering center to each other are independent. And therefore, the structure factor approaches one. So in all the cases that I will show you from now on, our scattering intensity is proportional to P of Q, and S of Q is one. Some examples of form factors. The simple sphere we have seen on the slide before, that was an experimental result for polydispersed spheres. This is a theoretical solution for a homogeneous monodispersed sphere with 600 nanometer diameter. <clears throat> and I purposely selected the Q range here in this plot to match with what is typical um, for a light scattering experiment. If we now compare that to a cylinder, and I wanted to keep dimensions comparable, so here the cylinder has the same length as the diameter of the sphere, and I made it, uh, yeah, 100 nanometer wide, so 100 nanometer diameter of the cylinder. That means we deal with an aspect ratio of six, so length divided by diameter. Um, you see already a significant difference of the cylinder form factor as compared to the sphere. I didn't do rescaling of the y-axis just to make it comparable. Yeah? If you would zoom out, then of course you would get some more information at least for my next example, which is a disk. 
So this is a form factor of a disk with 600 nanometer diameter, 100 nanometer thickness. And you can already tell, yes, there's a difference to the cylinder. There's, this, there's a local uh, minimum in that curve that you would see a bit more pronounced if I would zoom in here. But my purpose is to show you qualitative differences between these form factors. And the last example that I have is a prolate ellipsoide with, again, a length of 600 nanometer, a width of 300 nanometer in this case. And you again see that's a fairly different form factor. And the important point is when your object size is suitable for light scattering to resolve this form factor, you can really distinguish these different shapes. And this is typically considered using mathematical models for these form factors trying to fit the data. You can take into account polydispersity, of course, and then you can distinguish all these different shapes. Shape independent analysis is also possible. And this is typically done in the Guinea region. And I jump back one more time to the previous slide to show you what I mean by Guinea region. If you look at all these form factors, these four examples here, you see that at low Q, they seem to, or they do approach a plateau and a constant value P of Q. And this is also what I've shown you on the slide before that for Q approaching zero, you get a constant form factor when correctly normalized of one. And this plateau can be seen for all the different shapes that are depicted here as examples. And the Guinea region is pretty much close to these plateaus for all the different shapes. So as a rough rule of thumb, for a solid sphere, the Guinea region is found where the product of Q times radius of gyration is smaller than one. The range is a bit larger for globular proteins where we can approach almost 1.3. And what is happening in that Guinea region is that when you do a series expansion and solve your form factor, we get a completely shape independent form factor. One minus Q to the square radius of gyration to the square divided by three. So there's no shape information here. There's only RG determining um, our form factor. And this can be used for model-free analysis, and typically done in a Guinea plot. So what you do, and I've shown also an example here on the right, you measure the scattering intensity, you take the natural logarithm, you plot it versus Q square, thereby you linearize this equation here, and then you simply look in the Guinea region for the linear part of your scattering profile. And then you simply fit it by a solid line, uh, by, by um, uh, a linear equation. And then your slope basically gives you access to the radius of gyration. And this is extremely powerful because with a radius of gyration, you can learn something about the shape of your object, even though you cannot resolve your form factor. So consider particles that are too small for the form factor to be analyzed. But as, as long as you can do a Guinea analysis and get access to the radius of gyration, you can judge what kind of object shape you're dealing with. And for this, you not only need the radius of gyration, but you also need the hydrodynamic radius. This is now the topic for the next slides when we talk about dynamic light scattering. And here I want to highlight that we get different radi uh, ratios between radius of gyration and hydrodynamic radius, depending on the shape of the object. For a sphere, for example, we get 0.775 for monodispersed sphere. For hollow sphere with thin enough walls, we get perfectly one. So radius of gyration and hydrodynamic ratio uh, radius are equal. Random coils, so we deal with polymer coils, for example, monodispersed coils, the so ratio is 1.5, polydispersed coils, ratio is a bit larger, rigid rods, and I choose that um, example particular because I will talk about rods later on, we get a ratio larger than two. So now if we look at dynamic light scattering, 
I first of all want to show you again what the principle is. Now we have our detector positioned at one angle. Of course, we can do multiple angles each uh, after another if we wanted to, and I will show you why this is of interest. But the general measurement is first of all at one angle and looking at the fluctuations of the scattering intensity. So due to Brownian motion, we have movements of our solvent, of our particles, we have collisions between solvent and particles, we have collisions between particles and particles. So there's continuous motion in our sample and that causes concentration fluctuations. And these concentration fluctuations lead to fluctuations in our scattered intensity. And what dynamic light scattering now does is we correlate these scattering intensities. This can be done by an autocorrelator. So the instrument that you're using can directly provide you with the time intensity autocorrelation function, which is pretty much nothing else than multiplying intensity values at the time t by intensity values at time t plus some delay time tau. So the correlation function basically compares intensity values at different time differences on the recorded scattering intensity profile. And this is then how it looks like. So we have such a decay function for our intensity time autocorrelation function or G2 to a bit, be a bit shorter here. And then for the analysis, one is typically interested in the field time autocorrelation function. So it's uh, mathematically the same function as G2, but it deals with the electric field E and not the scattering intensity. We cannot directly measure this because the intensity or we, we do not have the phase information of our photons, so we just measure, measure number of photons, at least in a typical DLS experiment. But fortunately, there's a connection between G1 and G2. And this connection is given by the Zegard relation, um, which is pretty much a square relation between G1 and G2 with some baseline and some intercept. And I do not want to go into detail about these two, but the important message here is we can extract G1 from the measured G2. For a monodispersed sample, so consider, for example, spheres, all the same size. They undergo Brownian motion in a liquid, for example, water. And since they are all the same size, they all have the same speed or all the same mean square displacement or ultimately the same diffusion coefficient. So there's only one diffusion coefficient for all those different spheres. And then our G1, our field intense uh, field time autocorrelation function, is a sing single exponential function. And I will show you an example on the next slide that this is actually something you can measure. And what is extracted from this uh, single exponential is gamma, the relaxation rate. If we now deal with a polydispersed sample, we have different sizes, therefore we have different diffusion coefficients, and therefore we have different relaxation rates, and we have to consider such a distribution function, g of gamma, that contains the information of the distribution of these diffusion coefficients or relaxation rates. To solve this, there's different approaches, like the cumulant analysis or content analysis, to name two examples. And then you can pretty much um, get yeah, numbers for the average relaxation rate and the width of your distribution function. If you then have your gamma or your average gamma, we can then, for translational diffusion, get the diffusion coefficient. And the dependency for translational diffusion is that gamma is proportional to Q square, so the scattering vector to the square. And this is something that you can measure. Here's an example um, that we did uh, a few years ago using small, medium, and large particles. 
And plotted here is the average relaxation rate as a function of Q square. You see the nice linear relation between all uh, data sets or for all data sets of the different sized objects. And then you can very, very precisely with a super small error determine the diffusion coefficient dt from simply the slope of these linear fits. And then with dt, you can use the Stokes Einstein equation um, knowing the viscosity of your solvent and the temperature, of course, to then extract the hydrodynamic radius. And that is what you're most often will be interested in when doing dynamic light scattering. What is the hydrodynamic radius of your objects? And then I show you an example from a work that we recently did using spherical gold nanoparticles. So here's an electron microscopy image showing these particles. Um, the sample in the lab was stabilized by a polymer that we ne neglect for the time being, but I'll come back to this later. This is a form factor actually measured. The particles were, in this case, so small that we could not measure the form factor by light. So this is result from X-ray scattering. And if we then do a standard dynamic light scattering experiment, and with standard, I mean that we do not do any polarization analysis. So here we have our polarizer after the laser and the polarizer in front of the detector being parallel to each other. And we detect the fluctuating scattering intensity signal. And from there, we get our intensity time autocorrelation function that in this case, we could fit with a single exponential because our particles were for the light scattering basically monodispersed. So the dispersity is so small that they appear monodispersed in light scattering. And you see the nice agreement between fit and data. So the red line is the fit, the black line is the data. If we now to turn to depolarized dynamic light scattering, I start with the example of the same spherical gold nanoparticles, but it's not a, it's a virtual result here. It's not really a measured result. But I want to illustrate first how we do now a depolarized dynamic light scattering experiment. We have the same setup, but now we rotate the polarizer in front of the detector. And we rotate it that it's perpendicular to our polarizer in front of the sample. And if we have a sample containing perfect isotropic particles, so perfect spheres that are small, we basically get a count rate close to zero. This is cheating a bit because in reality, there is no such thing as a perfect um, isotropic monodispersed sample. So in reality, you will always measure some count rate, but typically for isotropic scatterers, you will not be able to correlate your signal as long as they are not large. And this geometry with the crossed polarizers is called the VH geometry. So V for vertical and H for horizontal. How do we do that in a real setup? Here's a photograph of the LS Instruments light scattering spectrometer where the red line illustrates the beam pass. So the laser comes from here, shoots through the lens, is focused on the sample, goes through another lens onto the detector. And in that setup, there is a polarizer just in front of the lens, so for the incoming beam, which is oriented vertical. So on the considering the, the table as your scattering plane, the polarization is perpendicular to that scattering plane. And then we have another polarizer or analyzer in front of the detector. You can rotate it. And if it's parallel to your incident uh, beam, polarization, then we talk about VV, vertical, vertical or, um, orientation. And if it's horizontal, we have cross polarization with a VH orientation. I start with results for gold nano rods. So we synthesized anisotropic gold particles. So that's a relatively easy, well-established protocol where you can also tune the aspect ratio and length of these rods. And we did do experiments on two different length rods with similar aspect ratios. Again, similar as for the spheres, we measured the form factor. 
Because those rods were small, much smaller than the wavelengths of visible light, these form factor measurements again were done by X-ray scattering. And then you can imagine that in dispersion, these rods, of course, will undergo Brownian motion and then therefore show translation motion, very similar to the spheres that I've shown you before. But in addition to that translation, the rods also rotate. I mean, the spheres do as well, but for the spheres, the scattering is isotropic, so we will not be able to see this rotation. For the rods, it's different. Yeah? Consider the rod rotating, um, then you influence the polarization of your incident beam. To start with how you analyze such unisotropic particles, is you typically do a combination of vertical vertical polarization and vertical horizontal polarization and this is now starting with a sort of standard dls experiment so do not be confused with the title of this slide but this belongs to the treatment of depolarized dynamic light scattering data so we start with vertical vertical polarization this is a standard correlation function that we record we can fit it with a function we'll show you soon that this is a bit different to the function as before so not as um, at least for this example, not a single exponential. And this becomes evident if we look at more scattering angles. So the first example was just one scattering angle, 120 degree. But if you look at more scattering angles, you see, oh, there's something happening. So in particular for small angles, you see that this correlation function becomes bimodal. So there's two contributions. Why is this? If you look at the mathematics, so the, the definition of these, in this case, field time intent, uh, field time autocorrelation function, we see that there's two contributions. And there can be even more depending on the Q-range we're looking. For simplicity, I show you the two terms here. One is related to just translational diffusion. So basically a single exponential term, including the translational diffusion coefficient. But then there's the second term, which is a cross term, containing the diffusion coefficient for translational motion, but also dr, the diffusion coefficient for rotational motion. Just to remember, to highlight again, for translational diffusion, we have previously seen the scaling of gamma being proportional to q square. And this we can now use to analyze this VV data. So we do angle dependent measurements, and the aim is to extract the translational diffusion coefficient from this set of measurements. And to be sure that we can decouple translation and rotation sufficiently well, we look at a set of angles, or we select a select, um, set of angles, where this scaling here is true. So what we do is we plot the collation function now as a function of q squared times tau. So not only tau, but tau times q square. And for the components where translational diffusion is clearly separated from the cross term, we get a set of correlation functions where for the second decay, we see a clear overlap to one master curve. So here, all the curves collapse onto one master curve and only for shorter times for the first decay, we have some deviation. And now this, angular range for this particular sample was 70 to 140 degrees, so still a decent angular range to do multiple angle light scattering. And then from there, we do the fitting and we get the translational diffusion coefficient as a function of Q. Now we turn to the depolarized experiment with VV, uh, VH polarization. So we now have cross polarization, vertical for the incoming beam, horizontal for the beam after the sample, and we do this now for the rod-like particles. Then we record scattering intensities and ultimately a correlation function. Again, the black line is the data, the red line is the fit to the data, matching really nicely to the data. We again did angular dependent experiments, and that's the result for many scattering angles. And now here, the mathematics for this equation is that it's in theory, it should be a single exponential where the exponent is the result of the coupling between translational and rotational motion. And now we know already dt, 
from the previous slides, so from our VV experiment, so from the standard DLS experiment. And that means we can now calculate dr. And again, we see for this example, as a function of q, we get rather constant values of dr. So this combination of VH and VV polarization for this example gives very precise, almost error-free values of rotational and translational diffusion coefficients. To show you some cases, some examples, I start with case one. This is uniform spheres, large enough to get some decent depolarized signal. And if we do that, our G1 should be a single exponential where the gamma, the exponent from the single exponential relation, is then a coupled term of the translational and the rotational diffusion coefficient. And what you do in experiment is typically also a combination of standard DLS and DDLS experiment from DLS and DDLS from the slopes of the data, you get the translational diffusion coefficient, and then you get the rotational coefficient from the intercept. So this is the simplest case for spheres. And as for spheres, uh, we only have one radius, large r. This is a translational diffusion coefficient. I've shown you this before. This is a Stokes-Einstein equation. And then also the rotational diffusion coefficient, which is very similar. You know? it just scales with r to the power of minus 3 instead of r to the power of minus 1. And then also the denominator is slightly different for the normalization. The second example is what people love to use in depolarized light scattering, um, well reported, is tobacco mosaic virus. And this, this virus is a cylindrical molecule or cylindrical object with a very high aspect ratio. So we deal here with rods that have a length much larger than, larger than the radius. And again, we have in this case, single exponential behavior for this G1 with a combination of rotational and translational diffusion coefficients. But now the definition of the diffusion coefficients is different. So importantly, we now have the length and the radius being parts of these two coefficients. So for long enough high aspect ratio rods, you can use the depolarized light scattering to directly pull out lengths and radius of your objects. And now I come to case three, which is rather low aspect ratio rods. And this goes back to the gold nano rods that I've shown you before. They're decorated with a polymer. And in our case, the polymer is sensitive to uh, temperature. And what that means is if we increase temperature, we can collapse this polymer shell. And what that does to the sample, it changes its volume, but it also changes its aspect ratio. So if you just calculate length divided by total diameter, you will see that this ratio changes when you shrink your shell. And the question is, what is the influence of this ligand shell? So combined results from this DLS and DDLS analysis gives us translational and rotational diffusion coefficient. And both increase as we increase temperature, so as we collapse the shell. And the reason of this increase in both diffusion coefficients is on the one hand reduction in hydrodynamic volume. So we shrink our particles because the collapse of the polymer shell leads to a reduction in volume. And then brown in motion becomes faster. So the diffusion coefficient goes up. Therefore, the diffusion coefficient rises. And, um, and also you've seen that in the Stokes-Einstein equation. And then due to the change also in aspect ratio or effective aspect ratio, we have also this huge increase in rotational diffusion coefficient. Now, for these rather small aspect ratio rods, and the aspect ratios were between you know, values roughly of 2 to 6, depending on the shell um, state, you have to use rather or different theoretical models to treat the translational and the rotational diffusion coefficient. So basically, we have now a dependency on this shape terms f of p and g of p, where p is the aspect ratio, so the length divided by diameter for the rods. We took a theory, a theoretical model 
which gives these shape factors for prolate spheroids. And we looked at rods of two different lengths. And here plotted is the translational and the rotational diffusion coefficient with the solid symbols being the experiment, the open symbols being the theory for prolate ellipsoids. And for 25 degrees, where the aspect ratio is relatively large, uh, is small, sorry, because the shell is swollen, we have fairly good agreement between theory and experiment, both for the translational and for the rotational diffusion. The discrepancy rises as the system shrinks and the aspect ratio goes up. And this discrepancy is attributed on the one hand because our polymer has a relatively high polar dispersity. We may have differences in grafting density on the tips of these rods with respect to the sides of these rods. And also we deal with a transition to a more cylindrical shape when the shell collapses and the aspect ratio goes up. And therefore the theory is less suited. The key message here is you have to choose the right theoretical model if you want to describe your um, DT and DR and pull out shape parameters, at least for rather small aspect ratios. With this, I would like to summarize. So light scattering is very powerful. It can give access to size, shape, dispersity, diffusion, um, and other numbers that I really didn't touch in this webinar, but there's more to access from light scattering. Static light scattering <clears throat> can resolve form factors for large enough objects, so when the diameter is close to the wavelength. It can provide the radius of gyration from model three Analysis, Guinea analysis mostly. DLS, in particular, angle dependent DLS can be used for diffusion analysis, depolarized DLS for analysis of N isotropic objects, and the resulting diffusion coefficients for rotation and translation strongly depend on the hydrodynamic volume and the aspect ratio. And then it depends on the different theoretical models that are available that you apply to this. To then, for example, get length and radius, at least when you're not dealing with high aspect ratio rods. With this, I'm at the end of my webinar. I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward for questions. Thank you very much, Matthias, for this excellent presentation. If you would like to reach out to us or keep in touch about future webinars, please visit our website, um, write us an email, or follow us on social media. I would like to thank everyone again for joining us today, and thanks again to you, Matthias, for your kind participation.